Hello, I'm Anna Richardson and welcome to our latest edition of Double I Double A Live. Previously, we heard from skin care experts who explained the main factors that cause skin to age, both internally and from the environment. In today's episode, we're going to begin by covering the question of how to tackle these concerns. As a skincare professional, you'll learn how to make real changes to your client's skin. Joining me in the studio today, we have a really international panel. From the USA, Professor Malcolm Maiden, all the way from South Africa, Dr. Des Fernandez, and from the UK, Dr. Rachel Watson. Professor Malcolm Maiden is a member of the Department of Biology at the University of Florida and professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. That's a mouthful. Dr. Rachel Watson from the University of Manchester is co-editor of the British Journal of Dermatology and Dr. Des Fernandez is a plastic surgeon and founder of Environ Skin Care. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the vitamin A revolution. Professor Malcolm Maiden has studied this molecule for over 35 years and has published over 180 scientific papers. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'd like to tell you all about vitamin A from the inside out. So when we eat vitamin A, a, a diet rich in vitamin A, or we take nutritional supplements, what happens? So what happens to, the, to vitamin A or retinol is that it is first broken down in cells to a molecule called retinal. And that is the molecule that's absolutely crucial for vision, which is why we need a lot of vitamin A for night blindness. As I mentioned in a moment, it's one of the earliest signs of vitamin A deficiency. This molecule is then next broken down to retinoic acid, which is the active component of vitamin A. So this is the thing that really does the job. And what does it do? It's crucial for development. It's crucial for all of those um, uh, organs shown there on the slides. It's crucial for our skin, as we know. It's crucial for our brain and spinal cord, for our blood system and our immune system. It controls the proliferation of our stem cells in our body, which have become a very hot topic in medicine, and it controls, for example, sperm production in males. So the reason why retinoic acid is so powerful is because it goes straight into the nucleus and switches on gene transcription, which induces new proteins. We've heard about MMPs, collagenases, and this is how it does it. It makes a perfect drug because it goes straight into the nucleus and it's very lipophilic. That means it goes straight through membranes. So it's really a perfect compound in order to take if you have any deficiency. So, why is it so important for development? Well, it's been well established over many years now that you have, if in the absence of vitamin A or the absence of retinoic acid, the embryo does not uh, develop properly and many systems do not develop properly. For example, we've shown you only have half a brain if you uh, develop in the absence of, of vitamin A. The vertebral column and spinal cord is also crucial. The blood system is also dependent upon the development of, of vitamin A. Our limbs are. We've shown in the absence of retinoic acid, you get no limb development at all. The craniofacial structures, the forebrain, the eyes are, the heart, and the UG system and gonads are as well. So it's perfectly reasonable to say it's the holy grail of development. It really is a, a, a crucial molecule for the devel proper development of our embryos. It's also very important for the uh, maintenance cells uh, in, our, in the adult, uh, in us, and we, you well know how important it is for your skin. How do we know this? Well, because in the world there are many areas where people develop in, the, uh, in vitamin A deficient diets, uh, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. And in humans, there, the World Health Authority estimates there are 190 million preschool children that have dry eye and night blindness. And this is the first symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. This leads to permanent blindness, leads to poor immune function and death. So many of those preschool children that die of things like diarrhea are going to be caused because they develop in areas where their diets are poor in vitamin A. We also know this from animal studies, and we've done many of these. If you grow rats on a vitamin A deficient diet, everything else in the diet is perfectly normal and perfectly uh, equivalent to the control. The animals, if you show them to a vet, they'll say, 
this rat's old. It's really quite remarkable. And there's a picture on the left there showing of a hunched old rat, which is the same age, a one year old, as a normal healthy rat, which should have a nice white coat and a sheen to it. It's remarkable what happens in the absence of this one molecule. You lose hairs. The coat loses its sheen. The animal has a hunched posture. The trachea becomes keratinized. Our tracheas are normally mucus lining. They become keratinized. You lose lung alveoli. You become less capable of breathing. Your skin develops hyperkeratinization. Sperm production stops. You lose motor neurons in your spinal cord. And the animals develop all the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Their forebrain cholinergic neurons die. They develop amyloidosis and amyloid beta plaques develop. Those are the nasty things that develop as, as lumps in our brains when we have Alzheimer's. And so here's a, a demonstration of that in the upper picture, a, a, a picture, an immunocytochemical picture of a normal rat's brain showing very little expression of beta amyloid. That's the nasty stuff in Alzheimer's. The lower picture shows you the appearance of brown amyloid plaques in a retinoic acid deficient rat. Just remember, this, is, this rat has had nothing other than one single chemical vitamin A removed from its diet. And the number of cholinergic neurons have been decreased. So these defects can all be rescued by giving back retinoic acid or vitamin A, which is the typical experiment that you must do to prove that this is the really important thing. So is it possible then that the appearance of these conditions as we age is actually due to a defect in the absorption of vitamin A in the retinoic acid synthesis pathway? It's well known, for example, that people in old folks home develop vitamin A deficiencies even though they, compete, they keep their diets going healthily we become incapable of absorbing many of these compounds in our diet as we age. So it's perfectly possible then that some of these diseases may appear due to the lack of absorption uh, ability of retinoic acid. And that's perfectly true in humans because we've looked in human motor neuron disease cases and shown that there are defects in the retinoic acid synthesis pathway and also in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. So this, it's suggesting, therefore, that many of these things that appear in aging are caused by the absence or a defect in the pathway of vitamin A or retinoic acid. And here we see a picture of that. Uh, in the graph, we can see a decline in the uh, expression of a receptor of retinoic acid in an Alzheimer's brain compared to a normal brain. Therefore, the next question immediately arises, can we rescue Alzheimer's in this particular model by giving back retinoic acid or a molecule that's uh, along that pathway? And, and the answer to that is yes. It's a really striking finding. Admittedly, we've only done it in mouse so far. But if you give a transgenic model of Alzheimer's disease, vitamin A or retinoic acid, the nasty compound in, in Alzheimer's is called amyloid beta. And the levels of amyloid beta drop massively when you refeed these animals back with um, retinoic acid or vitamin A. So it makes it a perfect drug for Alzheimer's disease treatment. That means it's um, the holy grail of maintenance of cells, not only of our skin, but also of our central nervous system and many other organs in our body. And for example, sperm production in gonads, as I've mentioned before. So it really is the holy grail of maintenance. So there's another area where vitamin A is really important, which we found um, because we were working on regeneration of tissues. So as I'm sure you know, we don't regenerate anything, uh, apart from actually from our skin. Um, we certainly don't regenerate complex organs, but there are some animals that do regenerate complex organs, and one of those uh, are the newts. And there's a particular animal called an axolotl, which is a, a laboratory animal as a, as a substitute for a newt. Uh, we see newts in our garden. If you cut limbs off these newts, they will grow back again. A really incredible process. And that's shown here. Uh, you can see in the blue staining the bones of our of our limbs, there's the humerus, the radius and ulna, and the hand elements. If you cut 
through the hand, it normally grows back perfectly, as shown in the top uh, picture. If you treat these developing limbs with retinoic acid or with vitamin A, in fact, as, as, as we did, it grows back an extra limb on the end. It doesn't just grow back a hand, it grows back two limbs in tandem, as you can see in the lower cartoon. So in organs where, which can already regenerate, vitamin A is a super regenerator, if you like to call it that. And subsequently, it's been shown that in many of these organs that can regenerate, vitamin A is absolutely crucial for the regenerative process itself. So we went on to show that in the animal, in those newts that could regenerate its limb, if you stop the production of retinoic acid or, or vitamin A, then you could stop regeneration completely, as shown in the top picture. X just means no regeneration. And this is now being widely found. It's also true, uh, there's a picture on the lower left of zebrafish, which can regenerate its caudal fin and its other fins. If you stop the production of retinoic acid or vitamin A in these organisms, you will stop regeneration of those uh, tissues, in that particular case, the, the caudal fin. And amazingly, the heart also regenerates in newts and in fish. And if you stop the production of retinoic acid in, those, in that organ, you will stop the regeneration of, uh, of those particular tissues. So, therefore, I know we can't regenerate anything, but perhaps if we extrapolate from these regeneration experiments, perhaps we can't regenerate things because maybe we haven't got enough retinoic acid circulating around, or we need to boost the levels that we do have. And in two cases, we've shown that that is exactly the case. So it turns out that in these two cases, retinoic acid, vitamin A, can induce the regeneration of normally non-regenerating tissue in a mammal. And by that I mean a mouse or a rat where we do these experiments. In the one case, it can induce regeneration of lung alveoli in a damaged lung. So on the left-hand side, you see a picture of a lung, and our lungs consist of millions of these very small little pockets called alveoli into which air comes and we absorb oxygen. Damaged lungs, uh, for example, by smoking or too much inhalation of other smoke in the third world where you have fires in the middle of your house, there's a lot of emphysema in, in the third world, many other ways of making a damaged lung. And an example of that is shown in the middle where you've, at the same magnification, you've lost your alveoli. If you now take a model of this in a mouse and you treat these mice with vitamin A or retinoic acid, you can actually induce regeneration of alveoli. And that's shown on the far right, where you've recovered all of those uh, alveoli and you've returned the lung to its normal state, shown on the left-hand side. A really remarkable process of inducing regeneration in a normally non-regenerating mammalian system. And the second case where we've shown this extra supply of vitamin A also works, is in a damaged spinal cord. On the far left, you see an X-ray of a typical damaged spinal cord by compression in, for example, a motor car accident. And if you treat mice where we've mimicked this injury with retinoic acid or vitamin A, you can actually induce axonal growth, the growth of neurons across that site of damage. And that's shown in the middle in that rather complicated bar graph, the uh, white bars show you the appearance of axons after the site of damage, which is shown between the second and third columns. And in behavioral studies shown on the right-hand side where each of the behavioral improvements is marked with a red arrow, you can actually show a recovery of, a striking recovery of behavior after treating these damaged spinal cords with simply vitamin A or retinoic acid. So in conclusion, then, we can see that the word holy grail is very appropriate. It's very important. Retinoic acid vitamin A is crucial for the development of many of our organs in the developing embryo. It's crucial for the development and maintenance of many of the cells in our bodies, including, of course, the skin. And it's also a very powerful drug 
for uh, the maintenance of these cells when they start to die, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, and it's also going to be used in the future as a drug for inducing regeneration of various organ systems. And I've highlighted two, for example, the lung and the spinal cord. And so it keeps us young. It keeps us, it maintains our cells, it induces regeneration of those cells, and it really is an anti-aging young compound. Many thanks to Professor Maiden for that fascinating talk on vitamin A. Now we cross over to Dr Rachel Watson discussing repair of ageing skin, the clinical experience. So today I want to talk to you about the repair of photoaged skin. So we've already heard that there are two forms of ageing and that the major environmental damage comes from exposure to chronic sun exposure. And you've seen this uh, image of the previous programme, I believe. And today I want to look at the dramatic changes which occur in photo-aged skin. So these photographs show women of the same age. On the left-hand side, you see a lady whose profession has kept her, on the whole, indoors. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see a lady who has, whose profession has made, made her um, be exposed to large quantities of sunlight. And you can see there's dramatic differences in how the skin looks. In our aged um, individual, the skin is generally smooth, there are fine lines, and, and the skin is generally pale. But in our photo-aged individual, the skin is much rougher, it's coarse and fine wrinkles, and it also has that sallowness, that yellowness to the skin. So sometimes when we go out into the sun, we get a single, very uh, severe sunburn. And the image on the left here is the, is the consequences that sometimes we see in the clinic. And this is a single acute sunburn. And you can see lots of changes to the pigmentation of the skin. However, on the right-hand panel, we see more, di more differences that are typical of chronic photoaging. You can see lines around the mouth, and I would put some money on it. This lady is also a smoker, and changes to her pigmentation. We also see roughness in photoaged skin. And we also see changes not just to the face, but also to the backs of the hands. And those of you with clients who are perhaps older will see these telltale uh, changes to pigmentation or age spots on the backs of people's hands. And I particularly like the autumn leaves analogy, though I'm not quite so keen about the coffin spots. And that's a little cruel. <laughs> of course, when we go out in our cars, we often are exposed to sunlight from one side only. And this is a really nice example of what happens if you don't seek um, help when you start to ch see changes in skin appearance. So this gentleman's a 69-year-old um, truck driver from the US, um, and this side of his face is protected, so it's the side away from the, the, the glass of his cab. On the other side, we see really some exaggerated changes of photo damage. And you can see it's where the light is coming in through the cab that's really exacerbating these changes. And there's been lots of work done in this area trying to understand what changes occur as we become chronically photo-exposed. In these images, what you see here is the red stain that I need to concentrate on. So this is the, uh, a marker which shows the synthesis of new collagen in the skin. And in areas which are protected from the sunlight, we see a strong, steady renewal of collagen. However, in photo-aged skin, this synthesis is switched off. And the more damaged you are, the less collagen you have. And this is also true um, of the elastic fibre system. So in the left-hand panel, we see a nice elastic fibre architecture. And in the right-hand panels, we see very uh, different architectures, very much reorganised. And we, we term this dystroph dystrophic. Uh, and it's called solar elastosis. And really, it's the hallmark of photo-aging. And there's one particular set of elastic fibres here called the oxytalian fibres, which are made of a, a protein known as fibrillin, which are lost really very early in the photoaging process. So here's our skin sample. Close to the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, we have these beautiful architectural arrangements of fibrillin-rich microfibrils or oxytalian fibres. And these are... Um, a mixture, the elastic fibre is a mixture of these fibrillin microfibrils and elastin. And then when we take those molecules out of the skin, they have this beautiful appearance. They look like pearls on a string. They're beautiful. Really, it, it makes my heart sing when I see micrographs like this. 
But what we know is that sunlight damages these fibres incredibly. This is work that I did too many years ago now to mention, where I looked specifically at these fibres in skin, and we saw that in photoprotected skin, we saw these beautiful arrangements, but in even very minimally photoraised individuals, the architecture is lost. So wrinkles are caused by uh, a loss of synthesis and an increasing breakdown by those enzymes, those metalloproteinases. And we see the same process as a wrinkle formation um, in intrinsic ageing, but they're exacerbated by chronic sunlight and by smoking. So can we stop ageing? Well, you've seen something very similar to this. I'm not going to get into the details of the, of the structures of these molecules, but important to know that all transretinoic acid is the holy grail of regeneration. And we've got some great evidence from clinical studies which show if you look at all the different treatments for photoaging that you might be prescribed by a doctor, that it's all transretinoic acid or tretinoin which shows the best improvement. And I've got a series of photographs now which I want to show you the improvement that we typically see in clinical treatment of skin which is photoaged with these topical agents. So on the left-hand panel, we see uh, a baseline photograph of this gentleman. You can see these coarse wrinkles around his eyes. And after 48 weeks, we see a much of an effacement of those wrinkles. The skin's smoother, it's brighter, it looks more plump. Likewise, we see an improvement in the pigmentary capacity of the skin. In the left-hand panel, you see all these age spots, whereas in the right-hand panel, you can see that they're much reduced. And the backs of the hands are a fantastic example. So here we have uh, one participant's hands. We can see after 40 weeks, all those age spots have been removed. And even better, when we take away the tretinoin, the all transretinoic acid, it's maintained. So it's really boosted the skin, really improved the quality of the epidermis. And this is just some quantification, because everyone, well, certainly if you're a scientist, likes numbers behind images so this shows that all of those features are significantly improved just to remind you a little bit of the histology again so we see in photo age skin this loss of collagen when we treat skin with all transretinoic acid that collagen synthesis is boosted back up so we see that red stain close to the epidermal dermal junction is is put back into the skin and this is, this is some work which we did in, in photoaged skin, which had been treated for four years with retinoic acid. And you can see those oxytalin fibres, again, have been renewed. So that, again, they're reconnecting the epidermis to the elastic fibres which sit deeper down in the skin. We see changes in the melanocytes and how effective and how active they are. So in conclusion, photoaging is responsible for the changes, or the majority of changes that we see in appearance. Photoaging is associated with this loss of both the collagen matrix and the elastic fibre matrix. And we know that the retinoids are the best researched um, treatments for repair of photoaged skin. Of course, prevention is much better than cure. And sunscreens, of course, are the most effective way of protecting our skin against the chronic effects of UV. Um, but of course, anti-aging does have an effect. And if you get the right preparation in the right person, then you may well see some really good benefit. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge Chris Griffiths, who's our clinical professor in Manchester for the clinical photographs. And just to leave you with this, that what we're doing isn't new. So this was taken from an archaeological dig, um, a pot of cream that was brought, um, that was made around 200 AD. It was remade in the lab. And if you look at B there, it looks very similar to lots of things which we provide for our clients and ourselves on a daily basis. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Dr. Watson. And also joining us today is Tracy Tamaris, Director of Education at the IIAA. And Tracy will be telling us about her experience at the Institute with the use of vitamin A to repair aging skin. Dr. Fernandes believes that photo-aging of the skin should be classified as a chronic skin disease caused by light exposure. And in order to treat it successfully, we really need to first understand the chemistry of skin and then develop a scientific approach to treating it. Aging starts in infancy and continues throughout our life. 
it can take 10 to 40 years for the damage to manifest itself in the form of wrinkles, dry, rough, sallow, slack skin with irregular pigmentation and even skin cancers. And these changes are caused by the interaction between light and chemicals within our skin, both on a molecular and atomic level. And we can control the rate at which our skin ages, and we can also reverse a lot of the damage. But none of this can be done without vitamin A. I grew up in South Africa on a beach um, with little or no sunscreen. And in my early 20s, I started to see uneven pigmentation and the beginnings of lines under my eyes. Luckily, I have been using vitamin A for the past 23 years and have managed to reverse this damage and prevent further manifestations. So here we have a very good example of a photo-aged skin. So this skin is vitamin A deficient as a result of years of light exposure. And six months use of vitamin A creams combined with protective antioxidants, morning and evening, have resulted in a much healthier, younger and normal looking skin. So even, have a look at the skin on her neck. You can even see the tightening effects in that area, and this is making her look years younger. So the reason vitamin A is so important for our skin is because it influences up to a thousand of our genes and controls the growth of our stem cells, as well as the way these stem cells differentiate into functional cells, such as keratinocytes and fibroblasts. It'll control how these specific cells grow and mature as well. And so for this reason, vitamin A will always be fundamentally the most important molecule to keep skin healthy and rejuvenate old skin. And we call it the skin, skin normalizer, and there really is no alternative. And here we have another example of a vitamin A deficient skin, and this time on the body. And after applying vitamin A together with a neutralized lactic acid for eight months, you can, note, you can see a noticeable improvement in her skin. So vitamin A will thicken the epidermis, and that's the growing active layer of our skin. It'll compact our stratum corneum, making the skin smoother, and it'll also stimulate the production of collagen and elastin, and this is evident in her tighter skin. And vitamin A can also normalize the production of melanin and lighten pigmentation marks, creating a more even complexion. So you can clearly see in this histology of skin taken before and five months after vitamin A treatment, the compacted and thinner stratum corneum and the thicker epidermis with well-defined layers. And there was 100% thickening of the stratum spinosum layer. Here we have a 12-year-old girl who was burnt with boiling water when she was two and she has scarring, pigmentation, as well as early signs of elastosis on her neck. She used vitamin A and antioxidant cream together with an alpha hydroxyacetona, and while in the sun, she used an antioxidant-rich sunscreen. And she applied these products once a day, and five months later, there's evidence of significant change in both her scar tissue and pigmentation. And this was achieved by her own skin cells, working with the correct, safe, effective vitamins in sufficient doses. So here is another example of changes to pigmentation, which is a common concern for many people as they get older. It's also extremely difficult to treat successfully. And we can see that the pigmentation distribution becomes more even as vitamin A and C control the production of melanin. So have a look at the mark near her temple. You can hardly notice it in the after photograph nine months later. And it's clear to see the changes in this skin over a five-year period with vitamin A, C, and antioxidant therapies. So vitamin A will also normalize sebum production, and together with the more compacted stratum corneum, will reduce blockages and hyperkeratinization. And we can get even better results when we combine that with regular mild home peels. So one of the things that I've picked up from speaking to beauty journalists 
is that there's a lot of confusion over the different forms of vitamin A. And generally, people associate vitamin A with retinol, but in fact, there are four main forms of vitamin A. And Professor Maiden has discussed, touched on these, but I'd like to just summarize. So retinol palmitate and retinol acetate, which are chemically stable, mild, active forms of vitamin A, and we store vitamin A in our liver, in our skin, as this form, retinal palmitate. More than 80% of the vitamin A normally found in our skin is in this form. And retinol is the alcohol form of vitamin A, and this is the way vitamin A is transported in the bloodstream. It's chemically unstable, and it's much more irritating on the skin than retinal palmitate or acetate. It's normally also found in very low doses in tissue. And retinol can actually pass through the placental barrier in order to provide the developing fetus with vitamin A. So retinol, which is a form of vitamin A we use to make visual purple, which is essential for night vision, and retinoic acid, which is the metabolically active form of vitamin A, which works on the DNA of our cell nucleus and is responsible for all the incredible changes we see in skin. So Dr. Watson has shown us fantastic results using retinoic acid. However, it is important to bear in mind that um, this form of vitamin A is only available on prescription, and it can also be extremely irritating to skin. But the really interesting thing is that it doesn't actually matter which form of vitamin A we use on our skin. They are all ultimately converted into retinoic acid once they pass through the cell membrane into the nucleus of the cell. So it's actually easier to load the skin with retinal esters, retinol or retinol in order to achieve the physiological effects of retinoic acid without the side effects. So the results that we see, we see with vitamin A are generally dose dependent. And by this we mean the, that you need to use higher and higher levels in order to see significant changes on the DNA of our cells. And this is where a step-up system is very useful. So it allows one to start on low levels of vitamin A and build up to very high ones without experiencing any retinoid reactions. So those who are most efficient will need to build up slowly while their cells make more vitamin A receptors. But interestingly, children whose skin is naturally very rich in vitamin A can use very high levels without experiencing any retinoid reactions. And if our skin is kept very rich in vitamin A, we can actually prevent the signs of photo damage even when we go into the sun. And it has been shown that retinal palmitate in adequate doses can have DNA protective effects equivalent to an SPF 20. Retinol, retinol, and retinoic acid do not have this effect on skin and can actually be photosensitizing. Interestingly, as our skin becomes healthier and the more vitamin A we use and starts to function normally, it actually becomes harder for active molecules to penetrate when applied topically. The stratum corneum is designed to protect the skin and that is exactly what it does. So, this is when we need to use enhanced penetration techniques to ensure high doses of these active molecules are delivered into the lower parts of the skin. And this can be done via product formulations, which make it easier for the molecules to penetrate. And clients can also use a cosmetic roller at home before applying the product. This will make the stratum corneum temporarily more permeable without causing any damage. And pulsed iontophoresis and low-frequency sonophoresis are also excellent ways of getting high doses of active ingredients into the deeper layers, more than 40 times better penetration than with topical application. So these methods allow you to use cosmetic levels of vitamin A to achieve results previously only seen with high doses of retinoic acid. And here we have an excellent example of the power of enhanced penetration of vitamin A and C. And this lady had 24 treatments using 
vitamin A and C with iontophoresis and sonophoresis, plus her home care products. And results like this are superior to using lasers such as Fraxel, and the skin is left smooth, thick, and healthy. These photographs, which have been taken over an 18-year period, demonstrate the regenerative powers of vitamin A. This lady, who started off in her 50s, um, used home care combined with enhanced penetration techniques. And as you can see, she has biologically, she's gotten younger, um, although chronologically, she's actually aging. So it's a fantastic demonstration of the powers of vitamin A. And vitamin A is not a new or fashionable skincare ingredient. In fact, by 1935, scientists had begun to question whether old, wrinkled skin was actually vitamin A deficient skin. And by the mid-1950s, it was discovered that a wrinkle could actually be reduced using retinal palmitate. So vitamin A is fundamentally the most important molecule in preventing and treating photo damage and aging. No other molecule has been shown scientifically to work on so many levels rejuvenating skin. Thank you. Okay. We heard earlier on just how extraordinary vitamin A is. And um, th this was news to me. I have to say I'm absolutely astounded by how crucial uh, this vitamin is in terms of our development, maintenance, and keeping young. So specifically, let's talk about vitamin A and skin. Mm -hmm. We heard, didn't we, that, that, that it's just extraordinarily important for skin. So, Malcolm, just to briefly explain again why it's so crucial in skin maintenance and keeping us youthful. Uh, because it's used endogenously there, like in many of the other organ systems I talk about. But in skin, it's, it's present, uh, it's required for maintaining the cell functions of each of those cell types of skin. Rachel talked about cells in the dermis. It's also true for cells in the epidermis. And you can mimic this in culture. You can grow skin in culture. At the, and at the air-liquid interface, it's been shown that their, their concentration of retinoic acid is crucial for the maintenance of the epidermal functions. If you, if you lower it... Uh, the epidermis changes, if you increase it, the epidermis changes. And so it's important because it's the natural molecule which keeps, uh, keeps the skin working. And do, do you think the general population is aware of the fact that vitamin A is just so crucial when it comes to, to youthfulness? No, they don't. So no, this is... I know that. <laughs> Rachel, I mean, do, do you think that, that within the UK we're aware of this? I, th I think... The consumers are becoming more savvy, I think. Uh, over the past 10 years, certainly, we've seen a change in what people expect to see from their face creams. So they're looking all the time now for evidence that you know, there's been some rigorous clinical studies around the area, that there's a bit of evidence to show that it has benefits. And that might be just on the outwardly appearance of skin, but it might be more histological, looking more at the mechanism. Um, so I think, I think as, a, as, a cons as a consumer population, we're becoming much more um, switched on to the fact that what people necessarily write on the box, you need some evidence behind that. So are the results dose-dependent then when it comes to, to vitamin A? Just explain a bit more about that, because earlier on, uh, off-camera, we were talking about which brands actually use vitamin A um, in their cosmetics. So just explain how important the, the dose is. So I think if, if anyone walks into the high street chemist and picks up a variety of brands and looks at the components within them, you'll find a retinoid in there somewhere. It might be retinoid palmitate, it might be retinol. Um, and the key, I guess, is, is how much is contained in that product. Now, the companies won't tell you percentages, or very rarely do they tell you the percentages that are contained th therein. But you have to see where they are on the ingredient list. So aqua will be the first one, because it's mainly water and then other things are added in. So the higher that retinoid is in that list will give you a clue as to how much is in there. So as a consumer, as an ordinary woman going into a department store or, or, or a high street pharmacist, how do I know which brands to trust? Which one should I be going for? Well, personally, I would go to those companies that have done some basic science research to underpin their 
findings, really. So it was, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I first started doing research in this area, none of the cosmetics brands did any basic research to understand how their products were affecting skin. Oh, really? So with the development of the, of the assay system that I spoke about earlier, that, the, sort of the idea is changing a little bit. And we had one or two very early on successes where we showed that a topical agent could Im improve the structure of skin. And from that, you know, the media get hold of it and there's a little nugget. And the bottom line really is that good science really sells products. So it engages with the public. They understand a little bit more about how their skin cream is having an effect on their skin. And then it moves on. We were saying uh, earlier on, uh, weren't we, Des, that actually um, in terms of... There's a very popular high street brand that contains re retinoic acid, but you said to me, oh, well, that's a very, very low dose compared to Environ. So your products really do pack the vitamin A in there. Yes, and uh, that's specifically... When I uh, started working on this, my concept was to get the same results as using retinoic acid, which was the medical form. Right. And when I realised that uh, it didn't matter which form of vitamin A you used, so long as you used the correct dosage in international units, for example, then you could get uh, similar results. So, so can, can we just talk a little bit more about dosage then? We touched on it earlier, but just explain to me, what is the optimum dose in terms of actually seeing uh, a, a result? Because we were saying earlier on, weren't we, that actually you, you need to sort of build up to being able to use vitamin A. So just explain a bit more about that, Malcolm. Well, it's a sort of basic biochemical concept that the more uh, you give uh, of a substance to a cell, there will be more activity, there'll be more metabolism. In the case of retinoic acid, there'll be more gene activity. And it's a straightforward concentration effect, increasing concentration, increasing effect. And presumably you've got to take the client's skin into consideration as well, because you don't know what level to start at, which is why Environ has this, this step-up system, That's doesn't right. it? So yes. just, just tell me a bit more about that then, Des, because it goes from level sort of one to five, is that correct? That's right, and uh, progressively, what we were trying to do by uh, starting this was to avoid the retinoid reaction. Which is what? Tell me about the retinoid reaction. So the retinoid reaction is when you get red, sensitive skin, maybe flakiness, uh, certainly dry, and um, it's a transient uh, uh, event. It uh, looks as though you've got an allergy, but uh, the difference from an allergic phenomenon is that uh, with the allergic phenomenon, if you carry on using it, it gets worse. Whereas with the vitamin A, you carry on using it and you go through the phase of irritation and eventually it gets uh, more and more uh, normal skin. So in terms of your system then, and in terms of the therapists we, we have here working today, you need to gauge the level of your client's tolerance, don't you really? Yes. But there's the one thing that I'd like to point out in which uh, you've done beautiful work to show that very low dose mm. of vitamin A makes a change. Mm. So level one is an extremely effective product. Ah, okay. And many people think, oh no, it's a starter, it can be ignored. I never ignore it. I always start people on very low doses and they may only progress very slowly. I think that's right. I mean, you know, we talked at the very beginning of the day as well about people tend to want a, a quick fix, don't they, when it comes to skin care. But you're saying absolutely not. You know, you start at, at, the, at the very basic level, and that's crucial, actually, because there's still sufficient vitamin A in there to make a difference and build your way up. Yes. I think what's really interesting is that when we started doing the original studies in the early 1990s, mm. um, even when you're using the sort of super strength medicinal um, types of all transretinoic acid, you don't really see great changes until three, four, five months in. So you don't see, it's not a switch that you're switching on, it is a, a stimulation of those cells. And you have to, if, you know, if, a, if, a, if a super medicine takes that long, then the cosmetic is going to take much less. 
And so when, you, when people are thinking about doing studies to see how uh, good a topical product might be, it's really important to understand that, that, that if you do it over a two or three month period, you're not going to see much difference and you're sort of almost setting yourself up for failure. And really you need to look at those longer term studies, those six months plus studies, to really see a, a difference in, in the skin biology. Why don't more cosmetic brands use and implement vitamin A then? What's going on there? Malcolm, do you know? No. no? Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess mainly, because mainly, well, you're in a business setting, it's a financial, I guess. These, the ingredients that you put into our, into our skin creams are expensive. They have to be very high quality, great levels of purity. They need to be stable over a long period of time. And all of these adds costs in. So it's about finding that perfect balance. So it might be the, the concentration of the retinoic acid. It might be antioxidants that you want to use to supplement it. It might be pentapeptides. I'm sure you're all familiar with pentapeptides. It might be the level of those that you add in as well. So it's about getting that whole formulation which provides the optimal balance for skin rejuvenation and repair. So does, will anything other than retinoic acid work and help to improve our skin? Well, we've seen quite nice changes in research work using vitamin C. Mm -hmm. We've also seen good changes in uh, the use of uh, peptides. Uh, specific peptides that uh, uh, produce changes in collagen and uh, elastin. And then, of course, you'll get improved appearance and some degree of improvement of, from the alpha-hydroxy acids. But I think that this is not in the same league no, as uh, uh, vitamin A. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, which age groups mm. can use vitamin A, because we've got this peculiar paradox, haven't we, mm. that actually children can tolerate very, very high doses, and yet as you get older and the skin thins, as you were saying, Des, it's very difficult to, to tolerate. You have to sort of build up to it. Yes. So who can mm. use it? Well, I... I put, um, I, I tell people this, if you're going out into the sun, you can use vitamin A on your skin. So that means little babies can use it. So in terms of the audience that we, ha we have here today, um, we're full of experts, we have therapists here. What would you guys be saying to them in terms of who can tolerate vitamin A, who can use it? Rachel. I guess it depends on what your client wants, really. I mean, I don't know how often you have young teenagers coming into your, your salons asking for anti-aging therapies. Uh, certainly, I have a 13-year-old daughter. She is very concerned about her skin. She's just getting to that puberty point and she's starting to have breakouts. And I have no qualms about her pinching my stuff because she does. I know she does. Um, <laughs> as does my husband, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> But, so I, I don't think, I think it depends on what the person thinks they need, actually. And having that in-depth um, conversation with them to really, because it's not just about your skin, it's about what you feel about your skin. So there's that psychological element as well. Before we wrap up, what do you use? Oh, I use... Uh, <laughs> I take uh, multivitamin tablets and I wear skin cream. I live in Florida now and I cycle to work every day and I use sport, that's 50 level scun, uh, sun cream on my face every day. Yeah, Rachel. so I do exactly that. So I'm 46 um, and I am an advocate of complete sun protection. Um, not so much that you don't have any fun, but at least 50, factor 50 for everyday use, um, because as we all know, we all put on sunscreens really badly. So actually, if I, if I put on a factor 50, then hopefully I might get a factor 15, actually, tolerance. Lovely. And, and Des, sorry. Sorry, and I'll say, and then I would use um, a, 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 a well-known branded <laughs> serum for around my eyes and any areas where I think I need more help, so my frown lines, etc. And Des, we, we know exactly what you're using, so uh, <laughs> no secret there. Thank you very much indeed to the three of you. Join us again next time for more practical information on how to deliver the very best results for your clients. I'm Anna Richardson for Double I, Double A Live.